replication cycle of these viruses. And again, what we want to remember, it was through basic research, understanding all the steps in HIV replication, that folks were able to develop this incredible arsenal of antiretroviral drugs. So they're, they're you know, again, you know, it's like never give up hope. Keep trying to understand the pathogen, you know, and it will give you new tools to help people to become infected with them. Okay, so we're, we're still on RNA viruses, you guys, but we're going to look at a very incredible group of RNA viruses, the retroviruses. And we will focus on the most famous retrovirus of all, HIV. And so our, our main character here is going to be HIV. So first of all, we want to take retro apart. Retro means what? Backwards, right? Backwards. And we want to understand why HIV is classified as a retrovirus. What do all these retroviruses share in common? So the backwards part here is um, uh, referring to a process called reverse transcription. And to understand this, you guys might remember that in the central dogma of information flow itself, it was developed by Francis Quick. Crick. Um, the central dogma of information flow in cells says that DNA will act as a template or a guide for synthesis of what? RNA, right? That's how information flow occurs in cells. And that process is called, we'll call it cellular transcription, right? Because it occurs in cells. Well, what blew everybody out of the water was that these retroviruses have a unique enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And if we were to provide the, um, the elongated name for reverse transcriptase, we would call it an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. And we want to tear the name apart, you guys, because the name tells us everything. Okay, so you might remember when we were talking about um, special uh, enzymes of viruses, we said these big, long names, they're telling us two, two important pieces of information. The first part is telling us what is the template. And the second part tells us what the enzyme is making. I'll just put a space here. So reverse transcript days of HIV, what is the template? RNA. RNA, right. RNA, right? That's a template to guide. And using that RNA template, what will the enzyme produce? DNA. DNA, exactly. So I'll put C, C stands for complementary DNA. So complementary DNA is produced. Okay? Now, that means that HIV are driving information flow backwards, right? Driving it backwards. So with HIV, HIV, I'll, 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 I'll orient it the same way, guys. What HIV is doing, it's using its HIV, HIV RNA genome to synthesize what? DNA. DNA, right? So see how this is driving information flow backwards? Okay, so this is the reverse transcription. And it's even wilder, you guys. I mean, this virus, if somebody, say, back in the night, you know, early 1900s, um, had written a scientific fiction, science fiction novel about a virus like HIV, people would have laughed them out of the business. They said, oh, come on, that, you know, what an imagination. Don't be silly. And that's, that's what HIV, you know, the more you learn about it, you go, that is incredible. That can't happen. Seriously? Okay, so let's look at this process. It's even wilder than this, you guys. So if we use, um, let's say we use white chalk. We'll use white chalk to be our cartoon for the, um, the HIV single-stranded RNA. And, and just as a G with you guys, we don't need to worry about it. It's, it's a plus for positive single-stranded single RNA, but don't worry about it. Okay, so reverse transcriptase, we'll just use RT for reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase binds to the HIV RNA. And so I'll put RT here. And uses it, so here's the HIV RNA, uses it as a template to make, what do you think R 
forms it here in this. This would be the DNA. Yeah, exactly. So I'll put I'll put complementary single strand DNA. And here's the part that totally blows me away. So the um, reverse transcriptase, part of it, it has many different catalytic portions of it. Part of it acts as an RNA, a ribonuclease, and that permits it to digest away the RNA template. And this is what blows me away, you guys. And then reverse transcriptase uses the DNA as a template to make what? Okay, and, and that was spot on. That was such a perfect answer. But it's even more sinister than that, you guys. They can use that, that DNA as a template. So here's the uh, complementary single strand DNA. This blows me out of the water. The reverse transcriptase uses the DNA as a template to make a second complementary DNA strand. So now what do we have? We have double strand DNA, right? Mm -hmm. Carrying all the genetic information to make more HIV. So let's call that double-stranded DNA carrying the HIV genetic information. Let's call this, just so it, you know, we have some way to discuss it, let's call this the HIV provirus. And maybe provirus sounds a little bit like prophage when we were talking about the temperate bacteriophage lambda. What happened in the lysogenic cycle of lambda phage? What happened to the lambda <coughs> DNA? Where did it go? And it's good to guess, you guys. Just guess, just guess. And I know it will reach it back up. But remember we said in the lysogenic cycle, the lambda phage would do what with its DNA? Where would the DNA go when it had infected a bacterium? The bromosomal DNA, exactly. Do you guys remember that in the lysogenic cycle? The lambda phage inserts itself into the bacterial chromosome. And there we called it a what? A prophage, right? It's exactly what the HIV provirus is going to do. So we're, we'll discover when we get into more of the details. The HIV provirus is going to get inserted into the chromosome of the cell. And the cells that are infected, of course, are our cells, inserted into the human chromosome. So if I got infected with HIV today, what would happen is that the HIV would use the reverse transcriptase to make the HIV provirus, and then that HIV provirus DNA is going to get inserted into my chromosome. And once it gets in there, I never, ever, ever get it out again. I'm, that's it, right? So isn't it wild, you guys, that we look at that bacteriophage replication cycle, and you see some parallels here in HIV. Isn't that just wild? But as you all know, you know, E. coli, you know, who cares? There's a billion trillion Googleplex of E. coli out there. But you know, humans are different. You know, humans are our family, our friends, you know, our loved ones. So what we what we want to explore then is how following this event, HIV can in many cases lead to complete destruction, crippling of our immune system, and then death from um, AIDS. And AIDS are the great plague of the 20th, 21st century stands for acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Syndrome because many things go wrong, not just one thing. So we want to, we really want to take time, you guys, to understand the replication of HIV. We want to understand structure functions. And again, you guys, the reason is it's been through folks' understanding of structure function that we now have this incredible arsenal of anti-retroviral drugs, anti-HIV drugs, so that nowadays HIV infection need not be a death sentence. You know, and back in the 80s when it was first discovered, it was really, really bad. It was very, very bad. Okay, so let's first tackle, let's first tackle um, structure. Okay. So let's tackle HIV structure. So wonderful news, you guys. HIV is an envelope virus. Why is that wonderful news? Exactly, yeah. I remember um, when, in the 80s, when um, AIDS 
was discovered in 1981, the HIV virus was, was discovered in 1983, and everyone was panicked. I mean, people were, uh, they didn't want to sit next to somebody that had the HIV. They didn't want to be in the same room. They didn't want to touch the same door handles. Um, people were afraid to, to shake hands with somebody that might have HIV. And all of that was based on ignorance. All of that was based on the concept that this is a highly contagious virus that it could remain infectious in the environment for long periods of time. And the, and the, the, um, the wonderful, the wonderful um, thing we now know is HIV is a wussy virus, you guys. That's why it has to be transmitted sexually. That's why it needs intimate contact. It's a wussy virus. And that's the best news, one of the best pieces of news about HIV. It will not remain infectious for long periods of time in the environment. You can hug somebody with HIV. You give them a big kiss. And you can play sports and what have you. So the initial phobia, just I mean, this hysteria of folks being afraid of others that had, had HIV was just um, wrong. Yeah, and it caused so much grief for the folks that were infected. Yeah, and we know that grief affects our immune system. You know, so back in the 80s was not a good time. Okay, so let's let's just tear this baby apart. Okay, so this is a little cartoon of HIV. The red represents the envelope, and that is stolen cytoplasmic membrane from our cells. So the HIV envelope is stolen cytoplasmic membrane from our cells. And as we know with envelope viruses, before they steal our membranes, they modify the membranes. And here we see in the membrane two very important um, envelope, excuse me, in the envelope, um, we have two very important HIV um, glycoproteins. So let's just go ahead and cartoon this. Start by you guys because this is like the most important cell of our entire immune system. 
are tea helpers of society. You got it. And I just want to take a moment, you guys, to explain why it's infection and destruction of these T helper lymphocytes that ends up crippling our immune system. Um, people often call the T helper lymphocyte, they call it the Achilles heel of the immune system. And I didn't work you my mythology, guys, but help me out here. So Achilles was, let's see here, his, one of his parents was human, right? One of the parents was a god. Is that how this works? Forgive me if I'm messing this up. But um, let me see here. So to protect him, to make him invincible, you know, indestructible, so he couldn't be killed, he was dipped in some kind of magic potion, right? <laughs> but but when he was being dipped in there, you know, you had to hold on to something. So they were holding on to his heel to dip him in. So that meant that he was invincible. He couldn't be hurt except at his heel, right? Because it hadn't been dipped in a protective potion. And in, indeed, part of the, the drama is is that Achilles eventually was killed by an injury to his heel, right? So we always talk about the weak spot of the system, of a strong system, as the Achilles heel. And that's what the T helper lymphocyte represents our immune system. It's probably the most powerful cell, but if you wipe it out, it destroys the entire immune system. Now, we're going to jump ahead here, you guys. I'm going to give you just a little overview of how T helper lymphocytes are involved in the immune system, just so we can appreciate how HIV and destroying T helpers cripples our immune system. So this is actually a topic we're going to come back to, but let me just, we'll just give it to you right now, just so it's bubbling on the back burner. So if we look at the crucial role of the CD4 positive T helper lymphocytes and activation of specific acquired immune responses, is that they're going to produce chemical messengers that help activate many other cells involved in specific acquired immunity. So these chemical messengers we'll call cytokines. Okay, so well, I'm just going to give it a generic name of T helper cytokines. So as an example, T helper cytokines, and I'll just use a little arrow here, T helper cytokines are crucial for helping to activate B lymphocytes. And we're going to discover that B lymphocytes are the cells that make our antibodies. And we'll also discover that um, these T helper cytokines are crucial in permitting these B lymphocytes to make what are called memory cells. And we're going to discover that memory cells are absolutely crucial um, for lifelong immunity against pathogens. Memory cells are crucial um, they're, 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 they are the reason vaccinations work. When we vaccinate our kids, we're trying to get them to make memory cells so that when they encounter um, the truly virulent pathogen or encounter a microbial toxin, they have these memory cells that will launch this faster, stronger, longer-lasting immune response. So again, B lymphocytes can't do their job right unless they have these chemical messages from T helpers. Another way to T helpers help with acquired specific immunity is that they're going to help activate another type of T lymphocyte called, I'll make it just big so, so we can read it, CD8 positive um, cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And these cytotoxic T lymphocytes are responsible for destroying virus infected cells. So once viruses get into our cells, these cytotoxic lymphocytes can identify those cells and destroy them, hopefully before the viruses have a time to replicate. These cytotoxic T lymphocytes are also responsible for destroying cancer cells. And that's going to that's gonna become important in HIV AIDS too. And then, and then finally, um, another way the T helper cytokines are, are crucial is they help to activate um, our macrophages, when our macrophages have been parasitized by what we call facultative intracellular bacterial uh, parasites, macrophages parasit parasitized by facultative intracellular parasites. Now, what I, what I mean by 
right, these faculty that do so are parasites. The classic examples are bacteria. Bacteria like Salmonella, bacteria like Listeria, bacteria like Shigella, bacteria like Yersinia pestis that causes bubonic plague. These are bacteria that can actually grow inside macrophages. Okay, so this will just represent our little faculty that just said are parasites. Macrophages have to be activated before they come become what we call angry killers. Angry killers are macrophages that make lots of mites of hydrolytic enzymes. They make lots of those toxic reactive oxygen intermediates, right? Normally, macrophages, they're just kind of, it's kind of like me in the morning before my second cup of coffee. I'm just like, I mean, I'm moving sort of, not really awake, not very effective, right? Okay. So the macrophages have to be energized by some high-octane coffee, we might think, and that's what the tea helper cytokines are. It's like high-octane, high-caffeine coffee for the macrophages. It wakes them up, it activates them, so now they can really start destroying those intracellular parasites and, and kill them, right? Without the tea helper help, the macrophages are like, mm -hmm. and those parasites multiply, the macrophages spread them throughout your body, they're protected inside the macrophage, so wow. So again, you guys, this is just to help us understand that when HIV invades these T helper lymphocytes and, and eventually destroys them, we're going to see a decrease in um, um, good antibody production. We aren't going to get our memory cells for our B lymphocytes. Our cytotoxic T lymphocytes won't get activated, and therefore we, we will have a decreased ability to control viral infections in our body, <coughs> vulnerable to really bizarre cancers that we normally wouldn't develop. And we'll be really vulnerable to these faculty of intracellular parasites. Well, one of them I forgot, you guys, Mycobacterium. Mycobacterium is a great example of the faculty of intracellular parasite of macrophages. So a lot of times folks with HIV AIDS, they die from um, um, TB that just runs them up in their body. Okay, so that's, I know that was a lot, guys, but this is the key. This is the key to how HIV kills us, is by wiping out these gorgeous people from the sites. Now, you all recall we said there was a second receptor, and we're just going to call it a co-receptor. I'll bring this over here. And this is another fascinating story. There's a second uh, molecule on the surface of our cells that HIV has to have to really infect our cells well. And I forgot to mention, you guys, um, this um, cartoon from Scientific America that we passed out, is it last time? Last time? Um, this, I think, is a really lovely diagram. And if you flip it over, there's a little box there, uh, a little table that talks about the HIV cell receptors. It talks about macrophages and people for lymphocytes. And we see there that um, the CD4 molecule, the primary HIV cell receptor, is present in both macrophages and T helpers. The co-receptors are a little bit different uh, distribution. Okay, so um, the co-receptor, um, one of them that is really fascinating, it's called the CCR5. These are cytokine receptors, or chemo, I should say chemokine receptors. Chemokines are specific types of cytokines. This is how um, our cells of our immune system can interact. They receive chemical messengers from one another, and then it triggers specific activities. So the CCR5 um, co-receptor, this is found in great abundance on macrophages. So it turns out, if I were to be infected with HIV today, that HIV virus select, it's gonna, it's gonna first go after my macrophages. So they often talk about, um, in early infections, the um, HIV are what they call um, monocyte macrophage trophic. So M trophic, they target the macrophages early in infections, and they think it's because the HIV is using the CCR5 co-receptor um, to invade the cells. <coughs> And then later in the infection, after HIV has been replicating in our bodies for a while, there's mutations, right? And so later in infections, later it seems that the co-receptor, co 
the co-receptor that they go after is that second co-receptor called the CXCR4. And this co-receptor is found in rich abundance on a T helper lymphocytes. So later in infections, as HIV mutates, as now it's going to start using that CXCR4 co-receptor, the HIV are described as t trophic HIV. Okay, so again, just to summarize, initially HIV appears to target our macrophages. Later in infection, after mutations, they start targeting our, um, our T helper lymphocytes. Right, so, so what? You know, it's like, God, you know, long lecture here, going on and on, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so why, you know, who cares? Well, understanding those co receptors has proved really important. And understanding why it is some people, who even when exposed multiple times to HIV, they never get infected. And then there's another group of people who, even though they get infected with HIV, they never develop AIDS. If we could understand that, maybe it would, it would reveal <coughs> new drugs that we might be able to use, right? So this co-receptor story, you guys, is so important. So why are co-receptors, why are co-receptors important? Um, um, why <coughs> some people, so first of all, never, oops, never um, become infected with HIV, even after multiple exposures, oops, never become infected with HIV. And you might say, well, how do they know this? Well, there are people in the world who have to make a living um, in the sex trade. So these are folks that make a living by having sex. And a lot of studies are done in folks that are involved in the sex trade because they are exposed to so many um, sexually transmitted pathogens. And so there have been folks that have been repeatedly exposed to different strains of HIV and they never get infected. It's like, what is going on there? And then there's um, another group of folks who may become HIV positive but never develop AIDS. So yes, okay, they have the HIV in their body, but it never replicates to such high numbers, it never ends up wiping out enough CD4 positive T helper lymphocytes for their immune system to crack. What is going on there? Well, there's one answer that helps, helps explain maybe some of these people, not all of them, but some of them, and it's that CCR5 receptor. So one explanation, is that these folks have a mutant CCR5 co-receptor. And in one study, they've actually identified the actual uh, mutant amino acid. So it's, they're called CCR5 delta 32, delta referring to the mutation, and delta 32 referring to the amino acid, the 33 amino acid in the co-receptor is different from what we call normal or wild type. And here's a wild thing, you guys. Folks that are homozygous, meaning they carry two copies of CCR5 Delta 32. They got one copy. They got one copy from dad, one copy from mom. Those are the folks that aren't infected by HIV, even after repeated exposure. And so what this tells us is HIV requires the normal wild type CCR5 before it can infect our macrophages. And remember, that's at the start of infection, right? Okay. And the folks that may become HIV positive but never develop AIDS, what do you think? What's their genetics? They're, right, they've got one copy, right? They're heterozygous, meaning they got one copy they have one copy of the Delta 32, and they have one um, wild type or normal copy. So half their, co half, oops, my half their um, CCR5 co-receptors are normal, but half of them are mutant. So that's really going to slow down infection.
infection of the cells by HIV. So yes, they can become infected with HIV, but because the HIV has such problems invading their cells, it slows down HIV replication. So those folks never experience this crash, um, huge loss in their T helper lymphocytes. So they never develop AIDS, right? Remember, it's the loss of those T helpers that kills us. It's not the HIV infection itself. So the other thing you guys that was so cool about this is when folks figured out those co-receptors are so important, they started thinking, wow, could we develop a drug that could bind to the normal co-receptor? And if a drug's binding to the normal co-receptor, can HIV bind to the co-receptor? No. And so understanding this basic part of HIV replication led to um, a drug, and let me, I'm going to cheat you guys on that little sheet here. Um, they're called entry inhibitors. And in 2007, so what, that's been like five years ago, they developed this whole new class of anti-HIV drug called the CC, CCR5 co-receptor antagonists. And so that was introduced to the HIV drug cocktails that have permitted people to live normal lives with HIV. So again, you guys, just trying to stress how basic research is so important. We think it's foreign, it's dull, it's like, who cares? But it can reveal these important drug targets. Okay, so that's that little tidbit there. Now, um, on, on the table of co-receptors, you'll see that um, CCR5 is described as kind of like the major co-receptor on macrophages. But, but you know, I, this always kind of bothered me a little bit. Um, but it does turn out that there's a subtype of T helpers called T helper ones, and they too can express some CCR5. And so that helped me to understand why it is these folks that have these CCR5 mutations, um, their macrophages would be protected, and a subset of their T helper lymphocytes would also be protected. Okay, you guys, so we'll just keep, I know we're almost running out of time, but we'll just see how far we can get here. All right, so it turns out that um, if we're infected with HIV, we will produce antibodies against GP120, and we will produce antibodies against um, GP41. So the question is, if those antibodies are neutralizing, why do we end up dying? I mean, if we're going to produce neutralizing antibodies against GP120, well, why, why can't we clear the infection? What's going on there? And maybe, maybe just need to tell you guys that, you know that reverse transcriptase? It can't proofread or edit. Okay, so we have major high mistake rates in reverse transcription. And then subsequently in, in HIV replication, we're going to discover that it's cellular RNA polymerases that transcribe the provirus into messenger RNA and more HIV RNA. And cellular RNA polymerases also don't so in HIV replication, we have two steps where we have incredibly high mutation rates. So what's happened, if I got infected with HIV by today, probably by the end of the month, I could have hundreds of mutant HIV circulating in my bloodstream with changes in the amino acid sequence of the GP120. So this is the other heartbreaking thing about HIV, incredibly high mutation rates. Right? So our immune system just can't keep up with all the mutant strains that are being developed in the body. Okay. All right, so um, just in the closing moments here, um, on today is Tuesday, so Thursday we'll come back and we'll talk about um, the other ingredients in HIV. This represents the capsid, kind of a bar-shaped capsid, and inside are two strands of um, positive sense are, um, HIV RNA. And because there's two strands, you guys, this permits recombination to occur. So let's say I got infected with two different strains of HIV. My same cell could be co-infected. So when the new viruses are being packaged, I could get recombination, reassortment of genetic information between two IVs, so there's more genetic diversity. Also, in the HIV, they come pre-packaged with reverse transcriptase, this little yellow blob. They have um, integrase um, pre-packaged. And then we'll also next time be talking about HIV protease, which is another um, enzyme essential for HIV replication, another great target for anti-HIV drugs. 
So we'll continue this discussion, you guys, in our third part.